There's a reason why Xtrades is currently the fastest growing application on the market for sharing financial ideas. With over $2.5 million paid in the last two years to contributors, users are flocking to see what trades the top traders on the leaderboard are sharing in real time. If you're looking to grow your reputation as a trader on the internet or discuss your trading ideas with other reputable investors, click the link below and get connected with the trading mentor today, completely free of charge. All right, what's up, everybody? This is Alex from X Trades back to you with another weekly trade ideas list. I hope everybody had a wonderful trading week last week. It was just an insane week on the stock market, especially if you were a majority long and had calls or just regular shares in the market, a long term holder. You had a killer week this week. And I would say it definitely caught a lot of people off guard. I mean, we had the markets closing under major structure loads. We had markets closing under major supports, breaking through demand zones, pretty much doing the opposite of what you would want to see for a bull run. And despite that, after the the Federal Reserve, pausing interest rates and hinting at some language of the hike cycle being over with, the market was able to rally and succeed. So last week, we had some pretty good setups. I mean, we were focused on energy and healthcare for the long side. I had more of a short tech focus just because it was breaking under structure lows and didn't look good. I was wrong on that end. And I didn't catch any tech rally or anything like that, which did the best on the week, which sucks. But energy and healthcare still did pretty good. And energy and healthcare are really good if you're looking for more of a defensive type of play and you're unsure about the market. Maybe the market's going lower and you can't find any relative strength. A lot of times you can find some strength in energy, healthcare, utilities, consumer staples, sectors like that as people kind of shy away from tech. And with the way the one we closed last week, it looked like tech was pretty ugly. So I kind of didn't really pay much attention to tech last week. And I missed out on a lot of that and opportunity cost, but that's okay. For this week, it's actually pretty boring on the event side and data side. We don't really have anything going on. We do have a lot of Fed speakers this week. You can see we got FedGov Cook speaking. We have the U.S. trade deficit on Tuesday. This usually doesn't move the market for data. And we also have Fed Bar speaking. Fed Governor Waller speaking as well and consumer credit at three. I don't really think it's going to have too much of an impact. I feel like the Fed speakers could if they start hinting at language similar to Jerome Powell of the rate hike cycle being over with. We could see maybe some moves off of that. But otherwise, I feel like a lot of people are just set on what Jerome Powell said at the FOMC last week. And then we do have an event with Fed Chair Powell actually twice this week. It's just going to be like an open discussion and live stream. I'm not exactly sure where it's going to be. But we do have him speaking at 9 15 and then we also have him again at 2 p.m on thursday at some panel at the imf i'm guessing that's the international monetary fund and that's basically it for the week so really nothing i mean we got wholesale inventories this is a hit or miss if it's going to move the market and then really just consumer credit and the trade deficit really no crazy data sets this week at all no cpi no ppi no pmis no isms nothing like that and we got the jobs data out of the week last week as well so we had non-farm payrolls we got to see the unemployment rate which ticked up just a little bit markets love that they want to see the labor market come down so they know fed tightening is working and we're able to see that so that's for the economic calendar pretty quiet week just pay attention to the fed speakers really all right, before we go into our setups and individual tickers, let's go ahead and go over the seasonality real quick. I don't have Season X this week, which is the usual website I show you guys. And that gives us exact kind of averages for the 25 years, for 15 years, 10 years worth of data we usually get. So last week we had anywhere from plus 0.5 to plus 0.7 for a rally on average. This week I don't have any specific. We're actually cut off again. So sometimes they'll let you use it for free and i don't really use seasonality that much so i don't have a membership with them it's like 50 dollars a month so it's just not worth it for me you can see we start to rally at the beginning of november and then towards the midpoint of the month is when we start kind of chopping out and we could see some downside towards you know the end of the month and then we rally at the actual end of the month so mid-november kind of sketchy so I would say we might have like another week of maybe potential upside or maybe just after that 5% rally in the SPX and the S&P, we could start to consolidate a little bit, kind of like what we see here in mid-November on the seasonality chart. But you can see, I mean, November usually always starts off really strong and the Almanac was showing that last week as well, as well as the season X data showed us a, a rally from plus 0.5 to plus 0.7. And I'm sorry, I don't have any specific figures for you this week. I just don't have the season X website today. They don't let me access the data without a membership so unfortunately that's closed off for right now maybe one day i'll invest in getting a membership i just don't really use it that much and i was kind of just using it to make these videos for you guys give you some sort of seasonality hint for the week and be able to make a, a decision on what to do with your portfolio or you know maybe kind of what bias to lean at on the week or month and that's kind of what i do here when i go into seasonality 
And you can see November is a really good month, minus the midpoint, kind of towards the end of the month. And then the actual end of the month is when we see that pump up rally up into December. So seasonality still looks fine. I would say just watch out at the halfway point, and then you can start being a little bit more careful. And for setups this week, I do have four. I'm looking at our first one here. We're looking at A, B, and B. It's a pretty clear downtrend breakout. You got to test one, test two, test three, test four downtrend line. It actually rejected, closed under it right here. I'm guessing this was after their earnings. Yeah, they had earnings on November 1st. But after that big candle, they were able to reclaim outside the trend line breakout. And now it's actually starting to look like it can get some momentum. So one thing we need to see it do, get over 122.80. It's going to be this resistance point right here. One point right here at 122.80. Another support area right here, 122.80. And overall, 122.80 is just a really good support level. I mean, you could probably even count this area pretty much as a 122.80 bounce. And it just looks good. So it's a good support. It needs to get over that. If it can do that, there is lots of potential to move more. Obviously, you have a peak out zone right here at 132.78. So maximum over time, I could see up to that. And then I'll have to see how it does from there. That's really all I can see for right now. There's kind of a little supply zone right here as well. It's a drop base, drop supply zone. You can see the base candle right here and that could act as resistance as well. So you gotta be careful of that. If you do wanna trade this, maybe buy time, go for like either December or January calls. That way you can deal with the supply zone, deal with any resistance and give it some time up to 132.78 as a price target. But breakout looks good. Just needs to get over 122.80, stay over it. Also get through this little supply and there's lots of free space above that. So Airbnb, looking at calls, maybe just buy time on it. Not sure if I'm gonna look at a day trade on this one. And next we're going into Google. So this is actually a pretty clear gap fill trade. It's just a one of those obvious, it starts closing inside the gap, which means there might be some momentum to continue further up into the gap, which was a huge gap down on earnings. They shedded billions and billions of market cap, which you don't see very often in these large cap names, especially ones that are making up, you know, the Magnificent Seven, which are the top tech names in the United States. So Google being down 10%, just not heard of very often, unless they really missed on a metric from earnings or had some really bad news. And their earnings, they literally missed on one metric. Now people are starting to kind of bid it back up and maybe people are trying to eye this gap now. And a lot of times when trades are this obvious, you know, you can see that mass psychology, everybody piles into it at the same time and you'll see that demand and momentum push up into the gap. And lots of times gaps do get filled. Obviously this one didn't get filled all the way. It took a little bit. It had a gap up here and it actually stopped right here before rallying and it didn't fill until it got over here at earnings in October. And this was all the way from July. So it might take a while, but gaps do usually get filled back up or down just depending on what it did. So Google here, I'm looking at calls. It's just an obvious gap fill trade. Really no sophisticated strategy to this or anything. It's just a gap fill trade. It could be an obvious trade that people are going to pile into. Everybody's kind of keeping their eye on it, and it could create that demand to keep going further up. One level you can watch, you can watch the gap support or the gap resistance point from when it opened on Wednesday. It's going to be at 128.31. If you want to see it holding over that, maybe if it dips into that, that could be a really great type of entry right there and it could try to go higher make that a higher low base to go higher up into the gap so if you want to watch that 128.31 as your must hold area in order to keep trading this up into the gap for calls you could do that and if it starts breaking under 128.30 you know you can maybe take it off your watch list for a brief moment wait for it to get back above that wait for it to get back inside the gap again just in case because you know stocks are random so it can happen we could just gap down below this for all we know. Just watch that 128.31. Look at it as support for now. And hopefully it'll be able to hold so you can continue up into the gap. So Google looking at calls. Just be patient. Probably going to be looking at day trades on this one. Just because gap fill trades, they move so fast. I mean, it could be a good swing trade if you buy time. You could give it lots of time to work its way back up through the gap. And with November and December being historically bullish, it could be good. You know, maybe get January calls. That could give it a lot of time to work through this. Let the seasonality play out let any dips or shakeouts keep you in just because you have time on your contracts and that'd be the smart move. So Google looking at calls. All right, next we're going into WFC. So the financial sector did pretty good last week. Every single sector did very good last week, but especially financials, especially IWM. I don't know if you saw the IWM last week. It was actually up like almost 3% on Friday. So just a huge gap up, huge run up. And IWM is a lot of financial focus. Like when IWM moves, so does banks and other financial names. 
So financials had a really good week, but a lot of them look a little bit overextended. This was one I didn't think look looked overextended, and that's going to be WFC. I actually bank with them. It's a hit or miss. I don't really care for them that much, but I've been with them for a little while. But anyways, you got a test one, test two, test three, four, rejection. So this downtrend was established and very good. Now it's trying to break out. It's as simple as that. There is a little kind of supply area right here. We do need to be careful of that. So when supply is in the way like this, I like to look at contracts with time on it. That way you can deal with any resistance, chop, anything at supply. And it's just a bonus if it's able to just gap through it or get through it. And lots of times, you know, stocks can still do that if it's bullish enough. So if you want to buy time on this, calls would be pretty good. We need to get over 4240s. It's going to be this area right here. It's kind of the top of supply as well. It was also a pretty big resistance over here. Uh, rejected over here. Rejected right here. Flushed right here. Rejected right here. So 4240 is big kind of area. Active support right here as well, as you can see in July. So it's a pretty good breakout zone that needs to happen, but it can act as resistance. That's why you want to buy time, deal with the supply, deal with the top of the resistance, and you won't have to worry about drawdown as much just because you bought time. So I'll probably be looking at December minimum, January minimum for a swing trade, something that gives you lots of time to work through supply, give it time to break over the resistance, or even deal with a big rejection at the resistance if it happens. You could probably just get fully out if it you know gets up to 4240 as well, but I feel like there's more potential here. Financials have been getting beat down for a while. Obviously, there's still a lot of macro risks. I don't think we're completely out of the water. Still dealing with the fight and in inflation. We're still dealing with bonds getting their ass beat. Lots of other stuff. Obviously, bonds had a great relief, and I was able to close out my TLT calls last week. I had a, I had a pretty good trades I closed out last week. I had snap calls. I had TLT calls. Got a couple shorts in. I had one short that didn't go good for puts on SPY. But overall, it's a pretty good week. I mean, especially if you're net long and just a majority long. But anyways, at WFC here, just buy time. Give it time. This breakout is confirmed. It's happening. So it will need to get over 4240s next. That's your next breakout point to go higher. Buy time. Give it time to do that. And you could be looking gravy here. So WFC looking at calls. Just buy time. Be patient. All right. And last but not least, and I put this last because this is going to be just a put trade, some type of scout play. I'm not looking to swing puts on this or anything because volatility is still pretty low right now. And you know, people are in buy mode at the moment, so I don't feel good about holding puts overnight in November. Maybe towards the midpoint of November, like I showed you right over here. At the midpoint is kind of when we start maybe seeing a pullback, but right now I feel like the seasonality is still going to hold, so I'm just going to be looking at short-term downside opportunities on this, and that's because this is a big drop-based drop supply zone. It's a really nice base candle, and there's potential that it could reject here just short term and they could give a nice put scalp to the downside. One thing it might do though as well, it might try to come up to the downtrend line. A lot of times you got a test one, test two, it's gonna come up for a test three to try to establish a rejection zone, some type of test off this trend line, especially if there's only two tests. And you could count it as three if you did this as well. So you got test one, test two, test three, it could be even test four. So it just depends how you draw it. But either way, I feel like it's going to try to make its way up to this downturn line. Eventually, it's going to test it some way, somehow. That doesn't mean it just has to gap up and touch it right away. But that is another area you do want to watch. So if for some reason, we do gap up on Monday pretty heavy. Let's say Navita gets all the way up here and you don't want to buy puts just yet. You could wait for it to get up to the downturn line first. And then once it gets up for that test, then you can look at puts for a scalp as well. But at the same time, this 450 area, you can look for puts as well for potential rejection. It just depends on the cash open and it depends how everything's looking the first 30 minutes of open. So that's just two ways to look at it. You got 450, which is the beginning of the supply zone. You can look for potential resistance. And if that doesn't work and we get over 450 and we keep going through 450, start looking at that downtrend line instead. And, you know, you can wait for it to test that before trading puts or scalping puts. So that's just two ways to look at it. You know, watch the 450s. If that doesn't work, then you wait for the trend line. Simple as that. So NVIDIA looking at puts, just look at it in those two ways I brought up, either 450 or the downtrend line, and maybe just stick to scalping puts on it. I don't like swing trades here for puts, but, you know, last week as well, I didn't like tech for long. So, I mean, I'm not always going to be right. I'm trading off what I see and not what I feel. And we'll go over SPY and QQQ next, but I just wanted to mention that, you know, I'm not always going to be right, but 
you know, I'm kind of just trading what I see and not what I feel. And right now I see this supply, I see 450 as potential resistance, and I see this downtrend line as potential resistance you could look at to scalp puts. So that's for NVIDIA. All right, and on to the indexes. We're going over the SPY first. So last week, we were focused on this 409.88, or you could just round it up to 410 and 408.80s. And I mentioned I didn't really like it that much. Like, I really didn't like this area for a bounce just because it was mid-range and it was so like, I don't know. I mean, it was good wicks, right? You got a good wick here, good wick here. You got a good area right here as well that led to this little rally. But I liked this area down at the 403s more or the 405. And I felt like SPY could go down to 405 a little bit lower. And we didn't do that at all. So we actually ended up ripping right off 410, which is really nice. So Monday we gapped up, had a really nice run up, but we still weren't out of the gulag yet. Even though we ran these two days, we were still under 418.31 and 420. So I was bullish above the 420s pretty much for weeks. And I felt good about dip buying at the 420s for weeks. And then we started closing under it. And that's when my sentiment shifted. So I just had to be careful with that. And that's kind of going back to my point of trading what I see and not what I feel. And what I was seeing was just crazy structure lows breaking, just not looking good with the possibility that 410 could hold. That's pretty much my outlook for last week. And I also felt that I wasn't going to look at longs until it starts clearing back over the 420s and 41831. And I was able to do that on Wednesday. So you can see once we got over it on Wednesday here, it was just two straight gap up days. And it, you know, once we closed over the structure lows, bulls came right back in. So it wasn't confirmed on Tuesday. It was confirmed on Wednesday that the bulls were back in play. Regardless of these two days of upside, people didn't really rush in until right here. And that's because you just have no idea how it's gonna react. I mean, it could have easily just back tested right here, made a, a lower high, and then gone lower back down to 410. So you gotta be careful with that. And most people would kind of assume that's what's gonna happen until they see it in front of their eyes. And they didn't get that confirmation until Wednesday when we closed at about 422s. So that's for last week, but this week we are, I mean, we just cleared so many levels, guys. It's crazy. Now we're at a big supply zone. So this is a big kind of a, it's kind of a rally based drop zone. This is a huge sell imbalance area. So if something happened in this big base candle to lead to this big sell imbalance, that's why I really don't like longs here. I mean, why would you want to buy inside supply? But at the same time, we do have this downtrend line that we broke out of. I personally feel like it could see just a tiny pullback. Obviously, it would need to get under 433, which is also a level from right here. So this is 433 this little bar right here. And then 431 is this structure low right here. So those are levels as well. So we're over both of those, the 431 to 433, which is pretty bullish, but we are inside supply. So it's kind of a no-go zone for me. And as well as the VIX is back under 15, which is just insane, guys. I mean, we were just at the 20s. So seeing volatility sell off, you know, 30% in two days, is just, uh, it's very rare. So now that we had the VIX crush, Volatility is crushed. ATRs are probably going to dry up. You're not going to see as big of moves anymore, in my opinion, unless we can get some type of pullback, right? If we can see some type of pullback and make that higher low or base, then we could kind of see more of an impulse move. But I don't think it's just going to keep going straight up from here after that big weekly candle after being up five, six percent in five days. It's just not realistic. Not to me, at least. And, you know, I could be wrong on that. And we could, you know, keep seeing more impulse moves up into the great seasonality we had, which we covered last week, a 25 year data set, I think it was averaging plus 0.7, 15 was averaging like plus 0.6, and then the 10 year was averaging like half a percent or something. So it was all bullish for seasonality. And I saw that, but I still, I didn't feel good about it just because of the structure lows breaking. And that's just what I was saying. You know, trade what you see and not what you feel. And then once we saw, you know, it get over 420, that's when you see that we're back bullish and you can start to look to buy the dips maybe and you can feel a little bit more confident to the upside. But now we're at supply and it'll need to get under 433, 431. It would also need to get back inside the downtrend line to even be bearish as well. So we need to get back within this. Also get under 431. And, you know, maybe we could see some downside but right now. No reversal signal, no type of bearish candle, anything like that. We're just inside supply and really anything could happen here. Obviously, bulls have in their favor over 433. They're over 431. They broke out of this downtrend line. Maximum, you know, they could get up to this downtrend line, which is test one, test two, test three. It could maybe get up to that. That's the maximum I could see. And it would need to get over... What is that? 438 to be able to do that, which is also the top of this supply zone. So this is just not, I'm not going to buy right here. If I'm going to do anything, I want to wait for it to get to the moving averages, 
So the moving averages right here, you got the 50, you got the 21, and then you got the nine. So we closed over the 50. That's a good thing. If we can get a pullback into the 50, which is going to be, you know, about 430, you know, that could be a good area to add for higher lows and add calls. Or if we can also get as low as the 21, which is going to be all the way down here, or maybe the 200, that's a good area as well. But I'm not going to buy right here. I'm going to wait for it to pull into the moving averages, see how it reacts to supply here. Maybe look at 430 as a potential dip buy zone. And that's about it. Otherwise, the supply, I don't feel that great about it. I definitely wouldn't want to buy calls inside of it. So that's my opinion. Breakout looks pretty good otherwise, but it may need a little pullback uh, to make a higher low in order to make a higher impulse move. But it just depends. We'll see how the algos are feeling on Monday. We have a lack of data. Uh, maybe Jerome Powell, you know, if he switches up any language from the FOMC, we could see some bigger moves. But I feel like it could be a slow week just with lack of data. And Jerome Powell has been pretty adamant on not walking back his statements or really talking down the market or trying to give in to any side, uh, bulls or bears or hawks or doves, he's just not giving into that. And he hasn't, at least since Jackson Hole in 2022, when he really wanted to reiterate that the economy needed to see pain in order for their fight on inflation to work. And that's pretty much appeasing to the hawks. So that's for SPY. Just watch 433 and 430 as potential supports. Also watch the supply. I could see some resistance there. So I really don't like it that much here for anything. Uh, if it can pull down into 430, I'd be willing to buy the dip. Volatility is low and that's about it. And then you have also these big gaps as well. So it's just all buy imbalance, which I really don't like. I want to see some kind of base being made here. I want to see some type of consolidation, some type of pullback, some type of higher low I can add at, and then we could look for more upside. But otherwise, it's all buy imbalance. Nothing, no red base candles, nothing for demand. It's just straight gaps and goes. That's for SPY. Just be careful here. All right, next for QQQ. Last week just looked awful. I mean, we were closing under 346.50, which is this little structure low right here. We also closed under 351.36, this structure low right here. And then we closed under trend line support as well. We got test one, test two, test three, test four, trend line resistance. We closed under that last week. So I thought tech looked like shit and rightfully so because it did. Uh, we didn't get any positive momentum until we started closing over this on Wednesday. So even Monday and Tuesday, even though it held 346.50s, it was still under the structure lows right here. It was still under trend line support and it didn't get that fake out impulse move to the upside after shaking the shorts out it wasn't able to get back over until wednesday and that's when i had a huge move and had a you know almost two percent day and on that day as well we opened back above 351 we also closed back over 354.71, which is this zone right here. This is the support we were looking to buy dips at weeks ago, and it was working really good for a while until we started flushing under it. But once we got over that, I mean, you could see the confidence in the market. It was able to fill this sell imbalance, make it all the way back to supply, and now we're at trend line resistance. You got test one, test two, test three, test four on QQQ. This is going to be test five at the downtrend line. So I really feel like it could see a little bit of resistance here, which kind of gives into you know, SPY maybe seeing a little dip for a higher low as well, down to 430. QQQ, lots of supply zones right here and trend line resistance. Unless for some reason we just gap over it. I feel like it could see a little bit of downside if we do gap over it. Obviously, there's a little bit more room up to 373, which is this peak right here. That's about as high as I could see it for right now. I don't want to be overshooting projections or anything like that. After almost a 6 7% move on the NASDAQ last week, it was actually plus 6.5. So it's six and a half percent move in just one weekly candle. So it might need a cool down. It might need some consolidation and it might need a little pullback to make it higher low in order to go higher. And that's what I want to see this week. I would like to see some type of discount zone that I could add at before trying to go long or anything crazy like that. And I showed you the longs that I do like, right? Airbnb and Google and WFC. I thought those look pretty good. The breakouts are fresh. Google's within a gap. ABNB breakout is also fresh. QQQ here needs to break over this as well as close over the supply in order to start going higher and get up to these supplies and also get up to 373.74, which is this peak right here. So that's all we're using. Using this trend line as either a rejection zone for confirmation or a breakout zone as confirmation. Keep it simple. If it starts looking like it's going to reject directly off of it and close under it, that could be a signal for some type of reversal coming at the downtrend line, even if it's just short term. So you got to see something there. And if you want to wait for some type of one day bar close, you could do that. Wait for the one day bar, see if it's going to close over 
or if it's gonna reject off of it and then close under. And that's how you're gonna see a projection moving forward, either you know, a short-term move down or some type of breakout play you know, to fill up the rest of the year, have that Santa Claus rally, et cetera. That's what you want to see on tech, either some type of breakout or some type of rejection right here. So just keep it simple. Watch this trend line. That's about all I got for it this week. You got lots of gaps. You got a gap here, new gap right here. So maybe one of these needs to fill before going higher. You know, this is a big buy imbalance unless it's going to start consolidating and, you know, just chopping out right here, making some type of new base. It won't have to fill up all this right here. If it can start, you know, stalling out and making some chop and, and consolidation, that's great. Bases are good. That's where accumulation happens. And that's where you'll see those big impulse moves come from, from accumulation, from higher lows, from consolidation, some type of slowness, trap the shorts, make people think nothing's going on. And that's when it really gets big and you can see those breakouts. So that's what you want to see on QQQ. Some type of base being made, especially if you don't want to see all this crap, all this buy imbalance, no types of bases, gaps. If you don't want to see those fill up, you want to see that consolidation or some type of higher low in order to go higher. And that's my opinion. I personally think this looks good for a put scalp, though. If it gets up to the trend line, it feels like a pretty easy play. We did some QQQ puts on Friday, made about 30% almost on those around the open there's a nice little reversal but obviously the bulls had a killer day so i could have made some money to the upside i just i didn't really like how extended we got so i was just aiming for more shorts and puts and we actually scalped this little re reversal right here at 10 a.m on friday obviously the bulls made way more money and they had a way better day but still nice to be able to get some downside opportunity and there's also that big supply i was also eyeing that which is this base candle right here. That's how we're able to do that. If you go to app.xtrades.net, you can see my alerts and my trades there. Even, you know, my losses, wins, losses, doesn't matter. You can see all my trades there, the timestamps, all that stuff. So go check it out, app.xtrades.net. All right, and last but not least, we're going into the VIX, which just had an insane week. We're either looking for a close over 2133 for a signal for volatility to go higher, or we were looking for a signal under 2081, a close, a one day close under 2081 in order to signal bulls are coming back to eat. And first day Monday, it was able to close under 2081. Once it got to that, all free space down to 1888. And it did that right here too. You see Monday the 23rd closed under 2081 straight shot down to 1888 the only thing is 1888 on october 24th right here it held up and closed and then the next day it just shot back up look at the difference this week on tuesday october 31st on halloween it got down to 1888 with the free space just like it did on these two bars right here it got down to 1888 but it flushed through and closed under and what happens when it closes under? That gives you more free space down to the next level. And that's going to be at 1708. 1708 comes from right here. So every anything you see with an arrow previously established, it's a previously extreme point on the VIX. And that's how we find our levels. 1708 with the arrow right here. 1888 with the arrow right here. 2081 with the arrow right here. Another one, 2081 with the arrow right here. 2133, arrow right here. So, and you got another 2081 right here. And that's how we're using these VIX levels. And you're looking for confirmation. You're looking for a close over or above. It's as simple as that. And using one day bars to do that. And last week we had Monday, the first trading day, closed under 2081. Second trading day, closed under 1888, which is our level right here. Third day, you had to close under 1708, which is this level right here. That gives you even more free space down to 1553. And 1553 has kind of been the most extreme point, in my opinion. You got a big rally off 1550s right here. Gem or area of 15s, big rally right there. You had to shoot up over there, shoot up over 1550s right there. Big bounce off 1550s right here was up almost 8% in one candle. Big sell off under 1550s, big shoot up over 1550s, big bounce over 1550s right here. And it's just, that's how you're using the levels guys. And it just, it just repeats itself. And you can see we actually closed over 1553 right here. On this Thursday signal, you could have argued that maybe we could have bounced there and volatility would have came back up and the market would have sold off. But it actually didn't. It flushed under 1553 on Friday, likely due to non-farm payrolls and other data. And you can see actually at 1040, we had a big spike up. It rejected directly off 1550 area, went lower, came back up, went lower again. So just crazy day for crazy week for VIX, actually. And now I don't even know what to think right here. I mean, it's just crazy. I wasn't expecting it to just butter through all of these. But I hope you understand the fact that it was closing under all of these is why there was free space to keep going lower. 
So it wasn't like this where it closed over 1888 and held. That's where it shot it back up. We closed under 1880s right here, free space down to 17, closed under 17, free space down to 1550s, and so on and so forth. Using the one day closes as potential signals to give you if it's going to go lower the next day, if it's going to go higher the next day. And you have to use, you know, the one hour, 15 minute time frame as well to see if it's holding up or flushing through these one day levels as well. But I would definitely mark these guys. I mean, it works really good. Gives you good volatility signals, especially if you're paying attention to each close. Gives great signals. So that's why the 2081 signal we were looking for last week was so important to see upside. And then the second most important, obviously, was 1880s. That's when you knew it became real. So once it actually closed under 1880s, unlike this, the week prior, it was able to close under that. They gave it lots of more free space to go down. So it just, it did the opposite. Last, or last week, it held up on the 24th. This week, it didn't hold up and it closed under. So just using those one-day closes to give you signals and to give you differences and trends and overall market sentiment. But for this week, I would just watch uh, 1460 and 1410. So 1410 is a 2021 low. I would go all the way back there, but I don't want to bore you or take up any more time here. 1410 is all the way from 2021. And it's a low I've been watching for a while. So it goes 1460, 1410, and 1273. Those are your major points from here. And you can see 1460 is actually a bounce zone right here. It's a wick zone right here, rejected right here, and it works pretty good. So 1460, definitely watch it. It's going back almost three years. And then obviously for bears, if you want to see some type of volatility signal come back, you're going to need to see that one day close over 1553 again. Simple as that. If it can start closing back over 1553, that can get you back up to 17. If it starts closing back over 17, that can get you back to 1888 and so on and so forth. Just literally look for the opposite as you would for this big downtrend. You want to start seeing closes over for, for bears or for volatility to come back. Otherwise, I mean, this could just keep going lower. So right now I got 1460 and 1410 as potential holdup zones, and it could try to hold up there if it does go a little bit lower, but that's about it. Otherwise, for volatility, I'm not looking for any downside or any really any crazy signal for volatility to come back until we start getting over 1553 for upside. It's as simple as that. And we could use that, you know, if we're going to trade spy pullbacks, QQQ pullbacks, if we're looking for downside after this huge run, we want to see that 1553 first. Otherwise, it's just going to keep going lower, and you should just you know be adding on dips you know taking advantage of this end of the year rally but that's about it guys just 1460 1410 and 1410 flushes obviously that just takes you back down to 1273 which is your triple bottom support on the vix and that's about it guys so either you're looking for a close back over 1553 if you want to see the market go down or you're looking for you know 1410 to flush 1410 just takes you straight down to 1273 and just keep it simple keep it at that but i hope this was educational I hope you can see how these one day closes were just very major in determining this trend and five days straight down for the vix the close under 2081 led to the close under 1880 the close under 1880 led to the close under 17 and then the close under 17 led to the move back down to 1550s and so on and so forth so that's all you're using just one day vix closes to kind of get some type of signal some type of bias some type of sentiment in the market right now volatility is selling off hard so it's going to need to bounce off 1460 close back over 1550s for the bears or start getting under 1410 for the bulls and go straight down to 1273 simple as that but i love you guys hope you guys enjoyed this video i'm gonna go ahead and get this chopped up edited and sent out i love you guys and i'm out